Patagonia. I feel like I should start off by saying Patagonia is not a streetwear brand. More like the streetwear culture has adopted it over the years. But the fact that a brand created in the 70s, originally as rock climbing equipment, can still be stylish enough to be accepted by the culture today is definitely a testament of the brand's constantly evolving nature. But how exactly did it all start? Well, let's find out. I'm Nate the Great from TakeFlight214.com and this is the Rise of Patagonia Clothing. Well, before we get started, don't forget to hit the like button for me. If you're a fan of the channel, then you already know why. And if you're new, just know that it helps us out a lot. But with that being said, let's get into it. In the early 70s, Yvonne Chouinard accidentally stumbled across an idea that would revolutionize the clothing industry. I'm sure he had no thoughts that a chance vacation from California to Scotland would actually lead to Yvonne building a clothing empire. In 1953, a 14-year-old Yvonne began climbing. The sport wasn't as well known in America at the time, but from a young age, Yvonne fell in love with the pastime. The excitement and intensity of rappelling down the side of sheer cliffs had him instantly hooked. Soon, Yvonne and his friends began going out on excursions on their own, traveling around America to rappel down rocks. On their travels, they would hop on freight train to freight train and travel from the west end of the San Fernando Valley to the sandstone cliffs of Stony Point. As he got older, Yvonne became more involved. Climbing became his way of life. And growing up in Cali in the 60s, it made him a bit of a hippie. Yvonne noticed the damages his climbing equipment had been having on the rock faces. And to try to prevent further damage, he began making his own equipment. This effort for looking after the environment would become a driving force behind the ethos of his future business. But this passion soon turned into an endeavor. He began selling his pittons, which are metal spikes used for climbing, for $1.50 each. Yvonne began supporting himself through the sales of his equipment, which allowed him to start traveling around the country, climbing by day and foraging by night. And in the 70s, or 1970 to be exact, on a winter trip to Scotland, he bought a rugby shirt to wear while climbing. Now this was a far cry from his traditional uniform made up of cut off chinos and white dress shirts, which he usually bought from thrift stores. But this impulse purchase would change his life. Built to withstand the brute force of a rugby match, it also turned out to be great for climbing. The collar prevented hardware slings from cutting into Yvonne's neck, and this gave him a great idea. He decided to start selling him along with his other equipment, and others were as impressed with him as he was. It eventually caught on as the trend took off. To keep up with the growing demand, Yvonne ordered jerseys from Umbro in England till they sold out. So then he started ordering them from New Zealand and Argentina, and they sold out too. The Chouinard team originally only looked at clothing as a way to support their equipment business. By 1972 though, they had expanded further. They were now selling raincoats and sleeping bags from Scotland, boiled wool gloves and mittens from Austria, and hand knitted reversible hats from Boulder. As the clothing side of their company grew, they decided it needed its own name, and in 1973, Patagonia was born in the back of a meatpacking factory in Ventura, California, where the company's headquarters remain to this day. Patagonia's name is derived from the mountainous region of South America, which holds the southern section of the Andes. One of the first jackets the company ever put out was a fleece in 1977 that was inspired by fisherman gear. In the 80s, Patagonia explored more sustainable materials and methods of production, including organic cotton, hemp, and polyurethane terra, terra fe, ah, fuck it, PET. They discovered a process by which they could recycle 25 plastic bottles into one fleece product, culminating in the debut of Cinchilla, one of Patagonia's flagship materials that best represents the mission to make high quality products 
with a low environmental cost. That also led to the Retro X series of recycled fleece jackets and vests, which added contrasting colors and chest pockets and hand warmer pockets on the sides. Patagonia continued to innovate not just in the material space, like introducing polypropylene layers to the market and touting the benefits of synthetic underwear in extreme cold climates, but also in the design space. The folks at Patagonia didn't spend much time thinking about what's cool. Instead, for over 40 years, they focused on making easygoing, high-performance gear that leaves the tiniest footprint possible. So how exactly did Patagonia become the darling of streetwear fans though? Well, for one, since the early days, the brand has always been environmentally conscious. And yeah, I know that term can be a bit polarizing in our highly polarized world that we live in today, but Patagonia is OG with it. For them, it doesn't really come off like a cash grabbing grift, like what it kind of does with some of these large companies that do it now because it was baked into the pie of Patagonia long ago. But surely it's not just the environmental stuff alone, right? Well, the modern expression of streetwear is somewhat of a paradox. As much as streetwear fanaticism is predicated on the new, it also values pedigree, which is where Patagonia enters the frame. Patagonia is sportswear in its truest sense, not as a catch-all or a marketing ploy. It's exactly what you would wear if you're doing, well, sport. The serious kind, like dangling off of a 2K or crashing through whitewater rapids. But it's this association that makes it as attractive as Supreme is to a kid that's never seen the upside of a vert ramp. But all the newfound hype also brought a fair share of scrutiny to the brand as well with memes like Patagucci and Fratagonia being circulated. In 91, Yvonne hated the thought of owning a billion dollar company that had thousands of employees making quote unquote, outdoor light clothing for posers. But Mark Little, Patagonia's director of men's sportswear and surf apparel, told GQ Style, quote, we can't control whether or not our brand is deemed as cool or uncool and we really don't even care. Patagonia pieces are not traditionally beautiful or stylish, more like a collision of colors, eggplants and oatmeals and muddy browns, but it's precisely this attempt to not be cool that's been so groundbreaking. Their anti-style approach has unwittingly changed the game. Rag and Bone, Helmet Lang, Landvin, and Neighborhood have all produced inspired looks based off the stuff from Patagonia. You can even make a convincing argument that the whole ugly wave in recent fashion all come from Patagonia's influence. Like it or not, Patagonia is to thank for much of this. And it's for this reason that they've not only been able to stick around for all of these years, but it found new fans generations after their launch. But what do you think? Are you a fan of Patagonia? Hit us up in the comment section and let us know. Also, if you haven't already, please consider hitting the like button. Liking and sharing the video is the best way to help us to continue to grow as a channel and we can't do it without you guys' help. And if you want to be updated whenever we drop a new video, then hit the subscribe button and then the notification bell to be emailed whenever one drops. But with that being said, I'm Nate the Great from TakeFlight214.com signing out until next time. Peace.